course, everybody here, I'm sure, loves elephants, don't they? Because if you don't, you're probably in the wrong place. <laughs> you might want to consider your, your, your next hour or so if you don't like elephants. Um, I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to see elephants uh, in the wild or in the zoo. I've been lucky enough to see them. I've even been lucky enough to know when elephants don't like having me around. It's quite scary when they decide that uh, you're a little irritation in their way and they'd like you to move to move on. But if you haven't seen elephants, I really hope one day you're lucky enough to be able to experience them in the wild. And somebody who's experienced them in the wild for a very long time, spent many years studying them, is Dr. Vicky Bolt, who's here today. She's going to come and speak to you about her fantastic research that she's been doing studying elephants, studying how they move, where they move, uh, and, and their conservation and the consequences of, of that. And she's going to share with you today stories about elephants, how she studies them. There's lots of kit here, so on your way out, do come and have a look at these if you haven't already. And Vicky has said if you've got a question or two for her as well, she's very happy to, to answer them later. So I'm really excited to hear what's about to start. So Vicky, it's over to you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks, everybody, for coming. So I want to start by taking you out of this building, out of Reading, out of the UK and south. I want to take you to Africa and into Kenya, southern Kenya. Um, this is where we're going. So we're going to southern Amboseli in Kenya. Um, and Amboseli is an ecosystem in southern Kenya, as I've said, but you might uh, recognize it because it's home to... Mount Kilimanjaro. So it has a beautiful Mount Kilimanjaro backdrop and you might recognise Mount Kilimanjaro from the opening of the Lion King movie. Now, we're arriving in Amboseli in June. So it's June, it's the end of the long rainy season. So everything is beautifully green. There's huge amounts of vegetation. That means there's huge amounts of food for everybody to eat. Now, in Amboseli, Amboseli is a savanna ecosystem, and what that means is that they have a very distinct dry season and a very distinct wet season. So rainfall falls predominantly in the wet season, and between the wet seasons, there's very, very little rainfall. So after the wet season, we've got lots of lush green vegetation, and that means we get lots and lots of lovely baby animals. So the animals tend to time their births with this time of plenty. So you see huge numbers of baby herbivores, the ones that eat the vegetation, and the carnivores as well that eat meat. And at this time of year, you also see huge gatherings of elephants. So it's a time of year where you see congregations of maybe hundreds of elephants. And the reason they do that is because it's a time of year where there's lots of food around. Now, elephants, as you can imagine, eat an awful lot of food. They eat for 16 hours a day, and they eat up to 150 kilograms in one day. Now, what does 150 kilograms look like? It looks like 1,250 bananas. That's how much an elephant is eating in any one day. So when there's lots of elephants together in one place, they can only really do that when there's lots of food and lots of water around. Otherwise, they end up competing with one another. So the end of the wet season, this time of plenty, is a great time for celebration for elephants. And in amongst this herd, I want you to picture yourself amongst this huge herd of elephants. In amongst this herd is a tiny baby elephant, really little, uh, just two months old. Um, and I wonder now if you can help me. So I want you to, you should all have a lanyard with an elephant ID kit in it. I wonder if you can help me identify this elephant. So have a look through your cards. And when you think you know which elephant it is, do exactly what this little boy is doing. Hold up the card you think it is. So I'll wait until a few more people have had a, had a think. Who is this elephant? I can see Mark knows. OK. Perfect. So I can see lots and lots of orange cards. So this little elephant is acacia. Now, acacia is the name of, of, a, of a, pl a plant that an elephant likes to eat, so her mum named her acacia. But you can see what's really distinctive about acacia being a calf, she has no tusks yet, so elephants don't generally grow tusks until they're about two years old. Uh, but also her ears 
are quite intact. There's no notches or tears in those ears yet. They are still a little bit wrinkly because she's been in mummy's tummy for so long or all crunched up. Um, so they're still quite wrinkly, but nothing particularly notable about acacia. So that's her real identifying features. So thank you. Well done, everybody. There'll be more of that as we go. Now, I want to talk to you a bit more about identifying elephants. And this is something we do in the field. So you can see me here uh, and my students with our binoculars. And we use binoculars because sometimes the differences between elephants are quite subtle. They're quite small. So we use binoculars to get a really close look. Um, and there's certain things we can look for when we're identifying different elephants, one individual from another. So the first thing we can do is look at who's a male and who's a female. So can anybody see any differences here between the male and the female? So we've got the male on the left and the female on the right. I can see some hands raised. So let's come to, in the green jumper, can you tell me any differences? Yeah, so longer tusks. Anything else? You can, sh you can shout it out at me if you want to. We've got some hands here, yeah? It's lighter. Lighter, oh, okay, interesting. Anyone else at the back? Okay, interesting. So there's lots of ideas there. Let's have a quick look. So one thing that we notice is the differences in their forehead. So can you see that the male has a much rounder forehead? Can you see that? And can you see that the female has a much more angular forehead? So it's much more pointy. So this is one thing that we look at between males and females. The other thing is their tummies. So a male's tummy slopes downwards from, uh, from near the elephant's head towards his bottom. So you have this slopey belly, whereas in the females, it's much flatter. So you can see that, that flat tummy in the females. But we're also right, we did see differences in tusks as well. So male elephants typically have much thicker tusks, and they may grow longer, although female elephants can also have very, very long tusks. Now... The other difference between males and females is their size. So you can see here, on the left you've got the female and on the right is the male. And this male is much bigger than this female. Um, and actually from the age that a male elephant is about 15, he's taller than any female elephant, however old that female is. So an elephant's life, so a female elephant will live for somewhere between 60 and 70 years. And a male elephant somewhere between 50 and 60. But from the time that that male is 15 years old, he'll already be taller than the oldest female elephants. So this is a really good sign as well. So you can see how much bigger this male is here than the female. Now, let's come back to tusks. So there's also tusks are a really another interesting factor for identifying individual elephants. So you can see here on this individual on the left, so both of these photos, top and bottom on the left, are the same one individual. And you can see that he's got quite wonky tusks. So this is another thing we can use to identify different elephants. And this individual on the right here, he shows another important factor we look at. And that's notches in the elephant's ear. So you can see this individual, maybe easier to see on the bottom photo, he has a big V-shaped notch in his ear. So that's something else we look at. The final thing is an elephant's tail. Now, the pattern of an elephant's tail is as unique as our fingerprints. So they can vary in terms of the length of the tail hair, the density of that tail hair. Some elephants have curly tail hair. Some elephants have blonde tail hair even. So this pattern of, of, of tail hair is also another really unique identifying factor. And you can also see from this image, actually, some elephants might even be missing the end of their tail as well. So you can see this elephant's missing the end of that tail. That might have been lost to an, a naughty hyena or a lion might have, have had that, or maybe it got trapped at some point. So these are all important factors that you should note as we go through the rest of the presentation, OK? Now, I want, you to, I want to bring you back now to this huge gathering of elephants. We're in amongst this huge gathering of elephants, and this tiny calf, Acacia, well, it's all a little bit overwhelming for Acacia. So she's hiding under mum's tummy. You can see that here. 
But now I wonder if you can help me. Who is mum? So looking at your elephant ID kits again, can you hold up the right card? Who is mum? So thinking again about those things we just talked about, tusks and ears, can you tell who this is? I can see lots and lots of purple cards, and you are correct. This individual is called Beetlejuice, okay? Now, Beetlejuice is quite a distinctive-looking lady. So you'll see, actually, that Beetlejuice has only got one tusk. She's missing her, her left tusk. Um, and that's something that can happen to elephants. Some elephants are born with two tusks, some are born with one tusk, and some are born with no tusks at all. So we think Beetlejuice was born uh, just with one tusk, and we've seen that actually some of her, her offspring have also only had one tusk as well. So we think it might be something that's passed on from, from mum and dad to their children as well. The other thing that's really notable about Beetlejuice is this big tear, tear she has in her right ear. So she, she picked this up. Um, elephants often pick up tears in their ears as they're moving through thick vegetation. Uh, they might get their ears caught on a tree branch or, or on some thorns in the vegetation. So sometimes that can cause little tears in an elephant's ear. The males also might have little tears caused when they're fighting with one another, when the males fight with one another. So these um, are things that they pick up throughout their life, but they can be really helpful identifying features. So that's Beetlejuice. Now... I want you to picture yourself once again in amongst this large herd of elephants. And what I want to show you now is what happens when lots of elephants come together. So this is a greeting ceremony between two different families of elephants. So keep your eyes peeled for lots of touching of one another. So elephants will use their trunks to touch one another to say hello and rub their bodies against one another as well. But also keep your ears open as well. All right? So could you hear that rumbling that those elephants were making? Those are greeting rumbles. So they're rumbling to one another to say hello. And those, those sounds travel over quite long distances because they're very low frequency. So sometimes human ears can't even hear all the noises that an elephant's making. Um, but those rumbles are very common when we have these greeting ceremonies. And you'll also have noticed there was lots of rubbing of one another's bodies against one another. The elephants were rubbing to say, and that's to say, hello, you're my friend, nice to see you again, okay? So lots of greeting going on there. And what Acacia noticed about her mum, Beetlejuice, was that Beetlejuice was greeting lots of other elephants, okay? She was uh, rubbing her trunk and her body against lots of others and doing lots of rumbling, maybe more than the other elephants. And so Acacia was wondering, why is it that Beetlejuice was saying hello to so many people. She seemed to know so many different elephants. And that's because Beetlejuice is the matriarch of her herd. Now, a matriarch is usually the oldest uh, female in a family group. And a family group is made up of adult females that are related to one another and their children, their offspring. So let me show you what that looks like. So Beetlejuice is our matriarch. She's the oldest elephant in the family. She's 38 years old. In her family are also her two sisters, who are slightly younger than her, Bellatrix and Andromeda, but they're also part of her family group. Also part of the family group are Beetlejuice's children. Um, so that's Blondie, Charm and Acacia, our little calf that we've already met. 
So these are also part of the family group. And then you've also got beetle juices, sisters, children, so her nieces and nephews. Um, so we've got Amarula and Amvula and also Curve. And finally, Beetlejuice's grandchildren as well. So one of Beetlejuice's daughters, Blondie, has already given birth to two, to two um, children in her lifetime as well. Now, what you might notice about this is that there aren't very many old males in the group. You can see lots of older females who are maybe in their 30s or their 20s, um, and some young males who are maybe 10 years old for Mvula or, or one or five years old for, for Blondie's children. But what, what that happens, because as a male elephant um, grows up and becomes older, they, they leave their family herd. They'll go off and spend more time on their own, but also with other male elephants as well. And that happens about 15 years old. So you'll see in this family group, although there are some young males, we don't see any old males, because by that point, they've moved off and aren't part of the family group anymore. So that's Beetlejuice's and Acacia's family group. Now, I want to bring you back to that, that herd, that big herd we're amongst. And there's some commotion now. Let's see what's going on. So that was two young male elephants sparring. So sparring is the name for a bit of, you know, wrestling or, 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 or tussling with one another. And this happens quite frequently between, between males, particularly teenage males, okay? They do lots of wrestling, maybe like, maybe like your older brothers and sisters might do with you as well. Um, so you can see here two males uh, sparring with one another. And you might have heard in the video as well the tusks knocking against one another as well. That's quite a nice sound. Um, but what we can tell from these, these interactions, this sparring between two different elephants, is uh, we can tell who's more dominant and who's less dominant. Uh, so who's the boss of who? So one way that we can tell this is, is looking at what happens. So in this interaction, you'll see that the male on the right-hand side has got his trunk on top of the male on the left on the left hand side. Yep. So his trunk is on top. And that is an indication that he is more dominant, stronger, older than the male on the left hand side. Uh, and that's something that's really interesting in male elephants, this dominance hierarchy. So the oldest, biggest males tend to be the most dominant, the strongest. So they're the boss around the, uh, around the herd of elephants. Now, I need your help again. Can you help me identify who was sparring? So who is this elephant? So look at those tusks. Look at those ears. Who is sparring? I can see lots and lots of blue cars, which is brilliant. I think you're all right. So this is Zama, OK? So Zama is a young male in his teens. And you'll see that Zama's real identifying features are this uh, V-shaped notch in his right ear, and also some other small notches in that, in that left ear, OK? But his tusks are kind of unremarkable. They're kind of short and straight. They're nothing really to, to note. Um, but it's those markings in his ear that make Zama really identifiable. But back to that herd. And all of a sudden, amongst that sparring, silence has fallen. And everybody, all of the elephants, are lifting their trunks and looking in one direction. And we call this behavior, you can see it in this picture here, periscoping. So a bit like in a submarine, they use a periscope, which is a series of mirrors that allows the people on the submarine to look up and over the top of the ocean. Elephants are using their trunks and their really good sense of smell to check out what's going on over there in the distance. So our whole herd of elephants have turned and looked over there. So what's coming?
So everybody's attention has turned because the huge dominant bull elephant has come in. The huge dominant male elephant has come in. And you're right, I can see some of you already. You're helping me. Who is our last elephant to identify? Who is this? Brilliant. So I can see lots of that bluey green colored card. Maybe it's teal, I'm not sure. Um, but you can see that this is Ingani. Now, Ingani, it, his name means, in Zulu, it means little one. But actually, he is the biggest elephant I have ever met. And he's also the biggest elephant in this herd, OK? So he's come in, and everybody's paying attention to Ingani. Now, just to quickly note his identifying features, you'll notice he's actually got one tusk, which is much shorter than the other. It's actually broken. Uh, and he will have broken that either when he's been sparring, like we saw with those young males, when he's been sparring with other male elephants, or when he's been using his tusks to dig up and uproot big trees. And elephants do that because they like to feed on the roots of trees, OK? Um, so one way or another, we're not really sure, but Ingani has broken that tusk. Uh, you'll also see he's got that notch as well in, in, his, in his lower right ear. So that's Ingani. Now, I said he was big. But how big? Well, one thing to say is that this tusk, so Ingani's intact tusk, the one that's not broken, is 1.65 meters. What does that look like? Well, I'm 1.65 meters tall. So can you imagine how big that tusk is now? Yeah, his tusk is as long as I am tall, from toes to the top of my head. He's also... 3.4 meters at the shoulder. Again, what does that look like? Well, this mark here, we measured out. Can you see that on the side of the screen? That's 3.4 meters off the ground. So his shoulder, the top of his shoulder, is about this high, OK? So you're starting to get the feel for how big Ingani is now. Now, how much do you think he weighs? Does anybody know? Any ideas? Go, shout it out at me. You can tell me. I've got a thousand. Someone's being clever. Someone said the weight of an elephant. Yeah. All right. Right, I'll tell you. So he weighs 6,500 kilograms. That's 6.5 tons or five small cars. Okay, so he's a big, big elephant. And this is him next to, roughly, you know, this is roughly what he might look like next to one of our Reading buses, OK? So just to give you a feeling of how big Ingani is. So now you can see why everybody stopped and looked when Ingani walked in, OK? He's an impressive elephant. So why is Ingani here in this big gathering of, of lots and lots of elephants together? Why is Ingani come here? Well. Something that's kind of new knowledge about elephants is that male elephants are actually quite social as well. So for a very long time, scientists thought that elephants, the male elephants, when they left their family groups, they were quite, quite lonely. They spent their life on their own and didn't interact with anyone unless they were coming to meet a female for mating. Um, but actually, what we've learned more recently is that ele male elephants also have very complex social lives. So they also have friends and, and elephants also that maybe they don't like so much, but they also enjoy spending time with, with other elephants. And you can see in this picture here, this is two male elephants, again, doing that body contact that I talked about earlier, which is a greeting. It's a hello, you're my friend, nice to see you. Okay, so male elephants also have these very complex social lives. So it's possible that Ingani is here to see his friends as well and to catch up maybe with his family as well and, and other elephants that he knows. Now, these huge congregations of elephants, these celebrations at the end of the wet season go on for, you know, a few more weeks. And the elephants spend time socializing with one another. They spend time mud bathing and swimming. And it's, it's a really lovely time of year for elephants. Everyone's happy and healthy and well fed. Now, actually, just while we're here, you can see a couple of these elephants mud bathing. So this, this individual up here is having a lovely time. And, and these two here are already, they almost look like chocolate elephants, don't they? Because they're covered in mud. Um, I wonder, do, does anybody know why elephants mud bathe? Why do they cover themselves in mud? So let's come to this, this boy here. Um, because, um, it's 
good for their skin. Very good. Anyone else down, down on the front here? Sorry? To cool down. That's a good one as well. Anyone else next to you? Sunburn, perfect. Any, and the green jumper? Because they do. Because they do. <laughs> Why do they do it? <laughs> so, I'll tell you. So, we had lots of good answers there, but you're right. So, number one, sunscreen. So, mud stops an elephant getting sunburned. You might think they've got very thick skin, but actually, it can be quite sensitive, especially the soft bits on their, on their ears and around their faces. So, mud is a good source of sunscreen. Uh, we'd use factor 50, I think, but the elephants just use the mud. Um, it's also a really good fly repellent, insect repellent. So covering yourself in mud stops the flies maybe landing on you and, and you know, annoying you, making you itch and scratch. So that's another ring. And also to, to cool down is the other thing. So lots of, so mud, especially at this time of year when everyone's happy and healthy and there's lots of food around and there's lots of mud around because it's wet and it's very warm. So Mud is a brilliant, um, a brilliant source of, of, of many uses to elephants as well. But as the rains have now ended, you know, we're thinking a few weeks since we've seen rain and we've had all these celebrations and everyone's been eating lots and lots of food, actually things are starting to get drier. The vegetation is starting to disappear. It's been eaten by the elephants and the other animals in the ecosystem. So there's not so much food around. The water's maybe drying up. And at this time of year then, elephants start to disperse. So they spent lots of time in these big congregations. And actually now, they start going off in just their family groups. So Acacia stays with her mum, Beetlejuice, and that family group we talked about. But other elephants drift off and do their, do their own things, OK? And as I said, at this time of year, things are getting much more dry. There's less food around for elephants. There's less water around for elephants. And this is something we, we've spent time studying in the field. So we, we know how much food there is at different times of year for elephants. And one way we do that is through habitat surveys. So you can see a couple of my students here um, helping with habitat surveys. And you might be able to see very faintly this picture here. You might be able to see these bits of rope laid out in a square shape. Can you see those? Yeah, so this is a quadrat or a, or a square that we've laid out on the ground within which we're going to measure all of the vegetation inside that quadrat, okay? So we're looking at how many trees, what types of trees, how much grass there is on the ground, and that's really important to tell us how much food there is available to elephants and to other species, and then we can understand why they might act in different ways at this time of year. So this is something that we can do in different seasons at different times in the year, but also over many years to see how habitats are changing um, over time as well. But as I said, this is very dry now, and, and it's not just the elephants who are now searching high and low for food. The other animals are also looking, uh, looking and traveling far in search of food. So you can see a wildebeest here kicking up the dust as, as he wanders off looking for food. And it's at this time of year that an elephant's memory is really important. So you might have heard that elephants have got an incredible memory, and that's true. And at this time of year, when food is hard to find and water's hard to find, an elephant relies on its memory to think, where did I go in previous years when it was very dry? Where did I find food before? Where did I find water before? And the most important individual at this time of year is our matriarch. It's Beetlejuice. She's the oldest individual in that family. She's the leader, the matriarch, for a reason. Because she's the oldest, she's had the most life experience. And so she's picked up the most information and knowledge about the ecosystem around her, where to find food, where to find water, how to avoid danger, and how to keep her family happy and healthy in these very difficult times. So the family follow Beetlejuice and they move, move around the ecosystem looking for sufficient food and water. But it's now October and the rains are meant to start again in October. But so far there's barely a cloud in the sky and things are getting very, very dry. You can see here this very small green stretch in the middle 
is the swamps, but even the swamps are now looking very low on vegetation. You can see all these animals, not just the elephants, have gathered at the swamps to find the last morsels of food at this time of year. So the rains are late and, the, and, and things are starting to get tough. Now, elsewhere in the ecosystem, we've got Ngani. Remember our big dominant bull. Now, he's spending lots of time on his own or with his male friends at this time of year. But he is also looking high and looking low for food. The thing is that Ngani has got a little trick up his sleeve or up his trunk, maybe. Um, Ngani knows that elsewhere in the ecosystem at this time of year, in October, farmers' crops are beginning to get ripe for harvest. So farmers will have planted their crops at the beginning of the previous rainy season. And by now, they've grown tall and they're, they're ripe for harvest. So, you, you know, corn, tomatoes, onions, watermelons, pumpkins, it's all lying in farmers' fields. And Ngani thinks, well, that might be tasty. I'm quite hungry. Maybe that's an idea. But of course, farmers have worked really hard as well to grow their crops, to grow their, their food, to feed themselves and their families and, and to sell at the markets to, to generate money, which they can use to send their children to school or to pay for health care. So the farmers don't really want to share their food with elephants. And it's important to note at this point that the people that are sharing the landscape with elephants also struggle. When the rains are late, they're also struggling to make sure they have enough food and water to feed their families. So they really, really don't want elephants to come into their fields and to feed on their crops because that's less for them and their families to eat at that time. But Ngani's tummy is rumbling and he's thinking, should I go or should I stay? So what do you think he should do, everybody? Should he stay or go? Just shout it out like we're at the panto. Should he stay or should he go? Go? Go, go and eat the food? Okay. I think most people are stay saying, go and eat the food in Ghani, right? So just as he thinks about going off and eating that farmer's food, the rangers show up. They come in their Land Rover like this. And they say, stop, Ngani, and turn around. You're not going to go and feed on the farmer's crops. We're not going to let you. How did they know where Ngani was? How did they know Ngani was walking towards the field? I think some people have got some answers. Shout it out at me if you think you know. Tracking, Tracking collars. I think some of you might have had a clue from some of the activities here at the front earlier. So you're right. So you might notice in the picture I showed you of Ngani earlier, he's actually wearing a collar. Um, you can see it here underneath his chin, or you can see me here wearing an, an elephant's collar that we've taken off an elephant as well. So just like your cat or dog at home might wear a collar, we can also put collars on, on elephants. Um, but what we also attach to an elephant's collar is a tracking device. So your mum and dad might have a tracking device in their phones that tell you where you are and where your nearest McDonald's is. Well, we also put tracking devices in an elephant's collar, and um, we can use that then to monitor where an elephant is, how long that elephant has spent there, where they move over time. And so what happened was that the rangers, a bit like this, the rangers were watching Ngani's movements on their, on their device, and they could see that Ngani was walking towards the farmland, and they knew that that was going to cause trouble. If Ngani went to the farmlands and fed on those farmers' crops, that's really not good for the farmers. It, it, it threatens their lives and their livelihoods. You know, if there's not enough food or, to eat or to sell at the market, that's a really big uh, bad thing for farmers. And actually, what happens in some cases is when elephants do do that and the farmers get really upset, um, they might retaliate and try and um, scare or injure or even kill elephants. So it's a really bad situation for both the farmers and the elephants, which is why the rangers have seen Nganis walking towards trouble, and they've gone out and they've turned him around, OK? So they've stopped him going and eating that farmer's crops. Now, there are other things that we can do to stop elephants feeding on a farmer's crops. Now, 
just watch this video. So this video is not as professional as the previous videos we've watched because this is my video. And at this point, I'm stood on a boat watching elephants. Okay, so it's a little bit rocky, you can imagine, okay? Um, but I want you to think. So these elephants are, are running, uh, running away from something. What are elephants scared of? So whilst you're watching, think, what are elephants scared of? Okay, so you will, have, you will have heard the trumpeting of those elephants. That's a, that's a fear. They're scared of something, that trumpeting. And they've got their heads held very high and their ears open. And you might even see they've got their tails lifted in the air. All of that is a sign that an elephant is very scared of something. So, does anybody know what elephants are scared of? You can, I can come to in the middle, in the red jumper. Lions, what else might they be scared of? Think a little bit smaller. Mouse, maybe. Anybody else? Shout it out at me. All sorts of ideas. All sorts of, all sorts of ideas. But I don't think I've heard bees. So did you know that elephants are scared of bees? Now, it might seem a bit silly because you might think, well, an elephant's got really thick skin and surely a bee sting isn't that bad on an elephant's thick skin. But the thing is that the bees in, in Africa are particularly, they, it really hurts when they sting you. And what they do is they target the soft parts of an elephant's skin. So they look for the ears on an elephant, which are quite soft, and around the mouth and around the end of the elephant's trunk as well. And what can happen is if those bees sting an elephant enough, especially in the trunk, um, it can swell up and it can make it difficult for an elephant to breathe even, okay? So it's quite, uh, quite scary for an elephant um, to, have, to have bees nearby. Um, and we can use that then to our advantage when we're thinking about how we can keep elephants out of farmland. So what's one idea that's come about is this idea of beehive fences. So what you'll see here is these yellow boxes. Each of, each of these yellow boxes is a beehive, so it's got bees inside it. And they are, there's a, uh, you can't really see, but there's a wire going between each of these beehives all the way around a farmer's field. And so what happens is as an elephant moves towards the farmer's field and tries to go in between these beehives, they knock the wire and the beehives swing and out come the bees and the elephants just even just the sound of bees and the elephant is out of here they're gone okay so this is a really great way in which uh, a really you know a fun way even uh, which farmers have found to keep elephants out of their crops and the other benefit is that the farmers then can also harvest the honey from the bees uh, and it's another source of income for farmers as well. So we said about how farmers can sometimes struggle to find enough food and, and money to feed their family and send their children to school. Well, honey is an extra source of income that they can use to support their family as well. So it's a win-win. It, it protects the elephants from the farmers and it protects the farmers from the elephants. And hopefully everyone is happy as a result. So in Ghani's turned around he's been turned around by the rangers and he's off he's back into the ecosystem away from the farmland but just as he turns his back clouds start to gather and eventually rain starts to fall the rains have finally arrived in Amboseli so they're late but at least they're here and very quickly what happens after rainfall is that the vegetation springs back. It's green and there's lots of fresh food for elephants and other animals to start eating. So lots of food again, which means lots of celebrations all over again. So elephants come back together and celebrate these times of plenty. And so Acacia is in amongst this big herd with her family and the other elephants uh, and everyone's having a great time. All except one. So on the edge of the herd, stood on her own, quietly contemplating as Beetlejuice, our matriarch. And she is thinking, when I was a young elephant, when I was little, the rains were never late. They always came perfectly on time. We never worried about not having enough food 
or water to eat and drink. Now, what's happening is climate change is changing rainfall patterns in Africa. So the rain is becoming much less reliable. It's hard to predict when the rain is going to come. And what that means is that we do have these periods where there is not enough rain uh, around in the ecosystem to regenerate the vegetation, to make sure there's enough food for, for elephants and the other animals to eat. It's also a time that's really difficult for people. If they can't predict when the rains are going to come, it's very hard to time when they should plant their crops and when they can then harvest. And this is changing. So like I said, when Beetlejuice was only a young calf, things were much more predictable. Things were much more settled, and, and they knew when the rains were coming and when there'd be plenty of food. But things are changing. And so she's thinking quietly to herself, what can I do about this? How can I make sure my family are happy and healthy and well-fed long into the future? And so she's thinking, there's very little I can do about the rainfall, but what I can do is make sure that my little acacia is well prepared. All I can do is teach her everything I know about the ecosystem, where to go to find food in these difficult times, where to find water, when to avoid danger, when not to go and eat the farmer's crops. So beetle just juice is just thinking, all I can do is make sure my little acacia is well prepared when she one day leads her own family as a matriarch. And that's that. So the elephants are back together again, and um, it's a time for celebration. Um, but as I say, it's a, it's a changing world for elephants and for the people that they share their landscapes with. I hope that you've learned something that you didn't know about elephants today, and I hope you've maybe come to love them, maybe a little bit as much as I love them. Um, I thank you all very much for your attention and for listening, and uh, I'll pass back to, to Mark. Thank you.